Hello, everybody. Uh, I will be the moderator. I apologize. I'm losing my voice, which is the perfect job for a moderator, so I don't have to speak, and I'll let these other people start. Um, all right, let me introduce our, our wonderful panel today. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, let me start with uh, Al Warden. He was part of the class of 19 uh, astronaut candidates in 1966. Uh, he served as support for Apollo 9. There he is. Welcome, Al, guys. He was on the backup crew for Apollo 12, and then the command module pilot for Apollo 15 from July 26 to August 7th, 1971. Uh, total 295 hours and 1.4 million miles of flight time, which is that's pretty good, I guess. Um, he taught at Northwood University. He ran for U.S. Congress in Florida's 12th district. I'm feeling very underaccomplished at this moment. Um, he founded Maris Warden Aerospace, and he's held several executive positions. Uh, he's currently a board member of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, providing scholarships for exceptional students in STEM fields. And uh, he's authored a book of poetry, a children's book, and a best-selling autobiography called Falling to Earth. Welcome. All right, our next uh, panelist is Jerry Griffin. Uh, he's got an aeronautics degree from Texas A&M. So those of you guys in the audience, nope, nope. There, I got one. I got one, Jerry. Um, he served in the U.S. Air Force and joined the uh, U.S. Air Force Satellite Test Center as a system engineer and flight controller, uh, and then moved to NASA in 1964 as a flight controller specializing in guidance and navigation, which, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, is very hard. It's very difficult stuff. Um, he joined as an Apollo flight director uh, in 1968 and was elite flight director for Apollos 12, 15, and 17. Um, he was also scheduled to be the flight director for Apollo 13 lunar landing, but uh, instead had to lead a, a Tiger team or anomaly response team. Um, and then served as a deputy director at Dryden, as well as uh, Kennedy Space Center, and then a uh, Johnson Space Center director. Um, he's been a technical advisor for several movies, inclu including Apollo 13, Contact, Deep Impact, and Apollo 18. Uh, and he currently serves as a consultant in private industry. Welcome. <laughs> All right, and our next guest is Laura Kearney. She's got a bachelor's and a master's also from Texas A&M, so we got a lot of, a lot of locals. Uh, there it is. Uh, has worked at, there she is. She's worked at NASA's Johnson Space Center for 26 years as a contractor and a civil servant. Um, she's big into health and fitness. She told me she squats 500 pounds and deadlifts at least 800, which is pretty impressive. It's mostly in zero gravity, so I have to tell you it's not as hard as it seems. Um, she's currently the deputy manager for the Gateway Program at Johnson Space Center and directs the program's development, test production, and operations. And her responsibilities include managing NASA, contractor, private industry, and international partner contributions across power, propulsion, habitation, logistics, robotics, and airlock elements. Pretty impressive. Um, I guess I should mention, I, so I'm moderately qualified to, to host this panel um, in that I also work in the aerospace industry. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at uh, Pasadena, California, and I worked on, most, most notoriously, the Curiosity rover that landed on Mars in 2012. <laughs> Thank you, a couple of shots, yeah. Um, and also, I have been in a Sharknado movie, so I'm highly qualified to moderate this panel. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, well, I think we're kind of we're focused on Apollo here. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, and uh, I think just kind of before we get started, there, I'd like to hear one space fact from each of you that you find either neat or a personal experience story. Al, we'll start with you. One kind of space fact or personal anecdote. You want, you want experience from spaceflight? Uh, I want maybe like an embarrassing moment in spaceflight. Do you have one of those? It's, um, if, I, if, I, if I get your question right, um, it's something you do once in your life. And you're lucky if you can get to do it once. Uh, it's, um, it takes you into a, well, so to speak. You, you, you're in a different world, kind of. Um, you're isolated. Uh, you're floating. You're trying to sleep. You're trying to eat. You got a ball of tomato soup floating around free, and you've got a real problem with that ball of soup because you can't touch it. Uh, and you got to do other things after you after you eat and drink. You got There are other things you got to do too. Which you know that's all part of spaceflight. And we were explorers, and we decided we're going to put up with all of that. Uh, we didn't shave, we didn't bathe, we didn't do any of that because explorers don't do that. Uh, our our role model was Lewis and Clark. 
And we thought if those guys could grow hair down to their waist and beard down to their waist, and they, they, and they only took a bath once a year, that was our role model. And so that was uh, kind of what we followed. But what's kind of interesting about space flight is, is that our spacecraft was cleaner than the cleanest room you can think of. Cleaner than an operating room. So we came back almost cleaner than we were when we left because the air conditioning system inside the spacecraft just kind of pulled all everything, all the molecules out. And so we were probably cleaner when we came back. There, there's a part of space flight, I mean, everybody thinks about you floating around, you're doing this, you're doing that. But there is living in space that you've got to contend with. And uh, sometimes that gets pretty boring. Uh, I mean, you know, how are you going to make a, somebody's got to cook the meals, right? <laughs> uh, so this is, a, this is a part of space flight that uh, is uh, rather mundane and boring. Um, but it's an old fighter pilot's expression. Uh, there are hours, flying in space, there are hours and hours of boredom punctuated with moments of stark terror. And uh, I guess we had our share of that. Yep. Jerry, how about you? You got, you got to take showers. Uh, but you were a flight director, which is, I mean, I, I've served a flight director a little bit for curiosity. It was a pretty amazing experience. Tell me, tell me what's your one space fact? You know, um, it was really a hoot to be a flight director uh, on a mission going to the moon to land and then get back. There's a couple of points that really stick out in my mind about uh, of those years. Well, uh, people ask me sometimes, you know, what's your favorite Apollo mission? Well, I didn't have any favorites. Uh, but I do remember two that I, I wanted to mention, and that the first one was Apollo 8. Um, people ask me if, if I thought of Apollo 11 was you know, probably the, the breakthrough. And actually, it, in my mind, it wasn't. It was Apollo 8. To remind those of you that may not be familiar, that's, we sent in December of 1968, um, and in fact, they arrived on Christmas Eve, uh, just the command and service module, no lunar module. It was not ready to fly. Um, so we just launched the uh, command and service module to orbit uh, the moon and then come home. The mission went very well. Um, and the moment that I wanted to share with you is the first time that we did a maneuver that was going to take us away from the Earth. And I remember when we, we called it translunar injection. You're in Earth orbit and then you make the maneuver to head for the moon. And I can recall how quiet it got in mission control when uh, a fellow named Cliff Charlesworth it was a flight director and he polled the team and told the Capcom that we would go for TLI and um, as soon as that maneuver started uh, we knew we had done something and when it ended uh, my first thought was now we've done it we've got these guys headed out uh, to the moon, and we got to get them back safely. But that moment was, uh, I think, for all intents and purposes, that's when the space race kind of ended, uh, before we actually landed uh, Neil and uh, Buzz on, on Apollo 11. The only other thing I'll mention quickly is I was, my first time to do a Saturn launch was Apollo 12. I was the lead flight director. And about uh, 50 seconds into the flight, we got hit by lightning. And it was a real fire drill uh, to keep from either aborting or deciding to go on. Long story short, I won't go into all the details. We went on, and in fact, we went on to the moon. And it was one of the cleanest flights that we ever had. It was one of the times, I think, where mission control really came through. 13, obviously, uh, was another one. But anyway, those are the two points that come to, to mind. And it, but remember, you see these pictures of astronauts and flight controllers, and they all look pretty serious. And uh, don't believe it. It was fun. It was in our DNA to do that. That's great. Uh, Laura, you're working on the future of human space exploration. I guess you want to share with, you know, your one space fact or one kind of space moment? 
Sure, I'm gonna actually, um, I know we're here to talk exploration and I've actually been in the exploration world for more than 15 years, but I, my fun fact I'm gonna share with you guys is on the International Space Station. Um, just because, you know, NASA has built on all the wonderful work these gentlemen did. Um, and unfortunately, there are not a lot of people out there that recognize that we have people living on an International Space Station 24-7, 365. Um, we've had the space station on orbit for 20 years. It's been fully manned for 18. Over 230 people have visited it from 18 um, countries. And so if, if you guys, you know, want to go home and share with your families and friends and just help people know that the space um, industry is, is up above you every day, uh, circling the orbit, and it's an international cooperation effort. Yeah, you, you actually hit on something there. So you, you talked a little bit about how you kind of learned from the legacy of Apollo. Kind of let's, let's hop into that a little bit. Uh, I mean, for, for you working there now, what are some of the key things that you remember or you notice that are kind of very much inherited from that experience? We actually, we're, we're lucky enough, you know, a lot of these folks are still with us today. And in our development programs, we, we reach in and we use these guys. Um, we have a lot of lessons learned documents. We do a lot of round tables with them. Um, we use them on our d independent review boards. The, they come in and, and check us and make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, the good thing is physics has not changed in the last 50 years. Um, and so, and a lot, it's really amazing actually. I actually, um, before my gateway job, I spent seven years building the Orion um, space capsule. And I can't tell you how many times I would sit in design reviews and I'm like, oh my gosh, these guys got it right 50 years ago. We would look at like new ways of doing things. And in the end of the day, physics is physics and bringing a spacecraft home going 20,000 miles an hour, there's generally one shape that is the happiest to doing that, right? I mean, parachutes work certain ways. So um, we have taken, we don't reinvent the wheel. We, we take their lessons and we build on them. Um, of course, we have the advantage of all of the modern technology and the computing power and the materials and things like that that allow us to fly lighter spacecraft, more intelligent spacecraft, um, things like that. So uh, we, we use every lesson these guys have passed on to us and make sure we're not reinventing anything. I also like to, just even the context of the time, because Jerry now, what changed over the course of the Apollo mission? What were some of the things that you guys were in real time learning and applying to the subsequent missions? Well, it, it, it was a step-by-step -step process, and it actually went clear back to Mercury. Mercury was a one-man capsule. We just figured out that people could survive. The longest mission was about 34 hours, I think, so it wasn't very long, it was in Earth orbit. We went to Gemini, a next step, and we, two-man ship, and uh, we learned how to rendezvous. We learned how to do a EVA, extravehicular activity, a spacewalk, if you will. And uh, we learned how to uh, also fly very long duration, flew one of those missions about 10 days, which said, yeah, you can survive a trip to the moon and stay and come back and you'll be okay. And then we got to Apollo. Well, Apollo, you know, we had the, the fire on Apollo 1 uh, on the pad and it killed three of our really good friends. Uh, and that was a wake up call that we had better be careful. We changed the atmosphere in the cabin because of that, because it was 100% oxygen before, which you can burn almost anything. And um, we changed to a more of an air mixture. And um, so that was just the first big step. And then each mission got more complicated and newer system. By the way, the onboard computer, I think had how many? 75, 75 uh, kilobytes <laughs> of, of storage. Um, and it was kind of like a Commodore 64, uh, something like that. Um, so we never got that changed. Now. Nowadays, you're working with a little more than that, so it's better. The one thing, big change, happened between Apollo 14 and 15. And I'll let Al talk about that, because we went from 14, we were pretty much transportation-oriented. Let's just get them up there, get them back, do what science we can. 
But when 15, we, changed, we flipped that. We became explorers looking for science, and we were comfortable that the transportation could do it. And, and he was the, on the first flight. Uh, yeah, a couple things about that. One, let me go back a little bit. Uh, make a comment about Apollo 8. I totally agree with Jerry. I think that's the most important flight that we flew. It was also the riskiest flight we ever flew because there was no redundant system for propulsion on Apollo 8. If they had lost uh, an oxygen tank like 13 did, we would never get the crew back. Uh -oh. They would be gone. They had no way of of propelling themselves into a trajectory uh, that would get them back. First launch of the Saturn V, too. First launch of the Saturn V. Oh, yeah, oh, and the first launch of the Saturn V. And as a matter of fact, I believe it was Apollo 8 that proved that centerline thrust was the thing to do mm -hmm. because they lost an engine during launch. Mm -hmm. They didn't change a thing. It just took them a little longer to get into orbit than they would have if all five engines were going. And it turned out, I think it was the center engine that shut down on them uh, during the launch. So that proved the big point to us because you could shut down an engine on the Saturn V and continue on into orbit and you're okay. If that had happened on a shuttle, we would have lost the shuttle. Well, we did. Challenger. That's exactly what happened on Challenger. We lost, we lost one of the solid boosters and that took the, the, took the plate down. Apollo 12 was interesting. I was the backup for the command module pilot, Dick Gordon on 12, and I was the guy who got them into the spacecraft early that morning. And I can tell you there was nobody more surprised than me when lightning hit them, and all of a sudden we're, we're, we're going crazy uh, on the radio. Apollo 15 was kind of a big jump in the program. You understand that everything we did, every flight built on the last flight. So every flight was a little bit more, a little more difficult, a little more um, uh, challenging, let's say. Uh, than the flights before, and as the flights went along, we could see the emphasis shifting more and more uh, until 15 came along, and we were totally science-oriented at that point. Uh, we carried the first lunar rover that Dave, Scott, and Jim Irwin drove on the lunar surface uh, to give them extra mobility. They could go further away. I think they got as far away as uh, almost two kilometers from... Uh, uh, from the lunar module at one point, they could not do that if they're walking. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, that's kind of an interesting one. If you're walking on the surface of the moon like Neil did on Apollo 11, he could only go so far away from the lunar module because he was restricted in the amount of oxygen that he could carry. So if the backpack burn, used up the oxygen, he had to go on his emergency, he had to be within a radius of the lunar module that he'd get back and get up to stairs and get inside and pressurize and all that. Along comes the lunar rover. Guess what? It's a Jeep. You can carry all kinds of stuff on a lunar rover. So you've not only got a vehicle you can drive around and, and go a lot faster, uh, they, there's various, various uh, estimates of how fast the lunar rover would go. But I heard Gene Cernan said yeah. something about 13 or 12 yep. or 13 kilometers per yep. hour. Uh, you had to be careful because if they hit the wrong kind of rock, that suddenly they're flying. Uh, on the surface of the moon. So they had to be a little careful how they did that. But we also carried a scientific instrument module into lunar orbit. That was kind of my part of the thing. In the, inside that uh, sim bay, we had a large camera, a res high resolution camera, and a mapping camera that had a, 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 a laser altimeter associated with it. The high resolution camera was interesting because it was designed back in the 1950s and it was designed to be used by the U-2 program when they were flying high altitude over all kinds of places that they shouldn't. And, and so that camera was declared obsolete by the Air Force before we flew it, so we were allowed to take it on our flight. Back then, we didn't have any digital. We're talking ancient history here. We had all film cameras. Uh, and uh, part of my job on the way back home was to go outside and collect that uh, canister from those two uh, uh, cameras and bring them back inside the uh, command module because what's inside the command module is the only thing that that that, that uh, survives the flight. Uh, so I did that uh, on the way back. But the the, the sim bay also uh, had a small satellite that we left in lunar orbit, and we also had a suite of remote sensors that guys at JPL would use to uh, analyze the surface of the moon. 
uh, we had uh, microwave, we had infrared, we had all kinds of uh, sensing devices. I have to tell you one story. Can I, can I tell the story? Okay. <laughs> we also had a mass spectrometer. Now, I think most people would understand what a mass spectrometer is all about. It was on a Canada arm, and it would go out about 30 feet outside the spacecraft, and it'd sit there while we're in, you know, in flight or in lunar orbit, and it had a big funnel on the front, and it would collect anything that's in its path, and it would analyze it, and it would tell you what's in lunar atmosphere. We did not expect there to be anything in lunar atmosphere. Dave and Jim go down to the surface, and, uh, and, and my trajectory over the surface is shifting a little bit because obviously the moon is rotating very slowly around the Earth. So my trajectory is offset, you know, each time I come around. I had the mass spectrometer out one day, and uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, um, you know, whatever could be in, in the lunar atmosphere. We didn't, we didn't think there was anything there, but, but, but we, I got the word back that they were collecting something. They, they had something. And it turns out that what they were collecting in lunar atmosphere uh, that, that the mass spectrometer was collecting was urine. <laughs> now, you can imagine what happened is we did, we did a urine dump, and then my trajectory is offsetting a little bit each time, and so that 30-foot arm out there is right in the middle of the cloud, and that's, that, and that's an interesting point because when you, when you dump the urine bag during flight, all you do is open a valve to the vacuum and all that liquid comes out, and it instantly turns to snow, okay, as soon as it hits the vacuum of space. The problem is that that cloud of whatever you want to call it, we'll, let's just say, we'll, we'll, we'll have a new definition for urine, and we'll call it snow. Anyway, that cloud of snow is out there a little distance from the spacecraft, but it's going the same direction, the same time, and the same speed that the command module is. So, once in a while, you can Liability. kind of look out the window and say, oh yeah, there we are. <laughs> Uh, I sometimes thought, hey, and Jerry, uh, I, I know this is not true, but sometimes I used to think, that's why we did mid-course correction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How is this not your space fact, by the way? I mean, I feel like... <laughs> um, I, so a couple of things. I mean, I, I, I kind of find, I found it fascinating because you talk about mass spectrometer, you talk about doing atmospheric science and, uh, the, you know, the rover on the, the surface of the, the moon, and it's, you know, we're in the same place on Mars, right? We have a mass spectrometer on Curiosity, right? We're measuring basically chemical composition. But there's no urine there. There is... Not that, it, yeah, we no. haven't found it. We haven't found the urine yet. Um, and our rover is, you know, capable of a top speed of about 50 meters an hour. Um, so nowhere near the, the speed of the lunar rover. Um, but it's kind of interesting to think of these as sort of progressing the technology, right, of demonstrating some of these things for, right. for new environments and, and right. such like that. Um, I think, you know, mentioning Apollo 8 and, and, and in my mind also Apollo 9, right, demonstrating the rendezvous and docking, which we don't often talk about how much of the challenges associated with engineering and building the things and, and demonstrating these first. And of course, we're seeing that with commercial crew and, and Gateway as well. So Laura, I kind of wanted to get some of your feedback in terms of what are some of the things that we're demonstrating today um, that are sort of what, what parallels are between the Apollo demonstrations and maybe some of the demonstrations that we're working on today? Uh, sure. So speaking of docking, actually, that's going to be um, a big one for the Gateway program. So, um, of course, they demonstrated first rendezvous and docking. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. You have to be right on. Um, Space Station, we have our commercial partners now, SpaceX, Boeing is going to be heading up hopefully in a couple of months also, docking with the International Space Station. Um, for the Gateway, we are going to rely on docking in a big way. You may be familiar again with the International Space Station. It was basically built by spacewalks. So we took the modules up in the shuttle payload bay. The Canadian robotic arm took the module out, kind of berthed it in close, and ultimately the astronauts helped connect all the connections. For us on Gateway, when we're orbiting the moon, we are going to assemble this Gateway completely autonomously by docking. So Orion will go up with a co-manifested payload on um, the SLS. When we get into Earth orbit, Orion will come out very similar to the way they did um, in the lunar program. It'll turn around, it'll grab that module, dock with it, and then it's gonna fly out, basically fly the module out to the Gateway circling the lunar orbit and then and pushing it on its nose, it will build the gateway piece by piece through the docking mechanisms. So um, all of the docking technologies that we have is gonna play completely forward. Um, of course, 
life support system is a big one, right? You have to keep these guys and gals alive on orbit. Um, everything we've done on the space station now is completely regenerable so that we don't have to take all of the consumables with us. When we go to deep space, um, we can't afford to carry everything with us necessarily, and so regenerative technologies are incredibly important for us. Um, so we've learned a lot in ECLIS regeneration over the last couple of decades. I'd like to ask the moderator a question. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, <laughs> did you guys on Curiosity, uh, could you take anything we had done in the Apollo years, the shuttle years, and apply that to what you did with the, which was, by the way, a fantastic landing. And, uh, but could you talk about that a little bit, about how you guys also built the stairway? Sure, and so, you know, Curiosity, obviously, we also had a capsule design on, re on entry into Mars. Um, a lot of that work was, of course, preceded by some of the, the previous missions. Um, but in fact, our guided entry was very similar to Apollo's uh, algorithms for, for guided entry. So that's the part as you enter the atmosphere, um, there's a, you can kind of go ballistically, which means basically you, you're, you don't care about where you're going. Uh, or you can do guided entry where you basically fly out some of the uncertainty atmosphere. So you, you can do a more precise landing. So if the previous missions had landing areas in the order of 100 to 200 kilometers on Mars, with Curiosity, we got it down to the tens of kilometers, um, and the next generation of rovers uh, is hoping to get it down to, to actually very precise landing um, with some mix of that and some other technologies. So that algorithm came straight out of the uh, Apollo. I know that you know because it's the same folks at you know Langley who eff effectively helped design that algorithm. Um, you know our, our heat shield technologies are, are similar but slightly different. We're doing ablative heat heating, so more more akin to the older than shuttle, for example, with the thermal tiles. Um, and I think those are the kind of the key areas. We have a different parachute because it's a supersonic entry. Um, and so we, we had to have a slightly different design for that on Mars with the lower atmosphere and the higher entry speeds. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of parallels in terms of that. Um, in terms of the rover itself, I don't know actually if, if so much of it, I mean, because we're using a six wheeled you know, yeah. mobility system, which looks a little different. Um, but I definitely know that that, that heritage continues on. And, you know, and it, will, it will continue, right? Once we've used it, it becomes part of the the library now effectively for the, the Mars 2020 rover and, and the missions after that. You know, you had, a, you had a, another issue that'll face us when we go to Mars with people, is that uh, the comm delay uh, was a, they had to, well, sp talk about that. <laughs> okay, it's great. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we, we don't have the advantage of pilots uh, in our case, so we, we have to, um, the rovers are, are, or the robots are op operating autonomously all the way from Earth to Mars. And as you leave Earth, the delay between Earth and, and the, your spacecraft grows. So Mars, at its closest, uh, at the very closest, we're on the same side of the sun, you know, it's four minutes away at the speed of light. So if you send a signal, it takes four minutes to reach there. The night of landing was 14 minutes away, so pretty far away. Um, and so that robot has to entirely be able to execute everything on its own. There's no joysticking, there's no, you know, people kind of sitting there and, and communicating in real time. We're getting data that's already 14 minutes old. Um, and so for, the, for our, our mission control, of course, we're really looking forward um, to the surface part of the mission. So we're not, we're not controlling it, we're just saying, did anything change from the Predix that we then have to tell the surface team to be prepared for? Um, whereas I, you know, obviously you guys are in, in real time sort of effectively commanding and, and making executive decisions. A lot of our landings are kind of done about two hours in advance and then we're just watching it and, you know, and sort of nervously awaiting the results. Very uh, nervous. Yeah, yeah, it's very much like taking those, like, if you remember taking like those tests where you'd be like, I did my SATs and now I just gotta wait to find out the results. That's kind of the night of landing, I think, for a lot of us is we're just like, okay, well, everything is, you know, on the surface of Mars one way or another. Um, <laughs> let's just wait 14 minutes. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I'm fascinated by this. So you also mentioned a little bit about the, the spacewalks and demonstrating those things. Uh, you did a, a spacewalk. I would love to hear that experience. I just kind of fascinated by it. Uh, yeah, um, going back to the sim bay and, that, and those cameras that they had back there, the high resolution camera and the mapping camera, they're in an outside bay, which is uh, clear in the back of the service module. Uh, and to get those film canisters back through the atmosphere, they had to be brought back into the command module. So my job on the way back home, I guess we're, I don't know, 196,000 miles out, something like that. Uh, we depressurized. Now that was kind of interesting. <coughs> get off on a little bit of a tangent here. Uh, 
um, there were some pretty serious considerations given to doing that spacewalk on the way back home. Uh, Dave Sott and Jim Irwin had both thrown some PVCs on the lunar surface. Premature and ventricles. Premature ventricular contractions. It, it, it was a PVC, you used an acronym. He used an acronym. <laughs> okay. Premature ventricular anyway, contraction. Okay, we'll make it simple. They were having heart problems. Uh, and, and Jim's was a little more serious than Dave's. Uh, and, and, and the word came up, uh, Dave, you and Jim take a sleeping pill, go to sleep for six hours. And Dave says, well, what about Al? And they said, well, if Al wants to, he can too. So obviously, in Mission Control, there was rationale that said, I was different from them. Well, obviously, they'd been on the lunar surface for three days, and they were dehydrated, and a lot of things happened. Um, and so it was, a, a, I, I'm sure it was a dehydration was part of that. But I think Jim Irwin was also a little prone to that kind of thing. So when it comes time for the spacewalk, do you take these two guys have had a little heart problem, and do you expose them to a vacuum? Uh, on the way back home, uh, do we make uh, Jim Irwin stand up in the hatch and, 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 and take uh, uh, possession of the cameras? And, and the decision was finally made, yes, go ahead and do it, because one of two things, Jim was getting better by then, and the, number, and, and the second thing was those ca the film in those cameras was so important to the program. So again, it's risk-reward kind of thing, and we said, okay, we'll take a chance. And Jim was fine through all that. Uh, I went out the hatch. I got to tell you another funny one. <laughs> Dave and Jim, when they're on the surface, they had the cameras. They had the Hasselblads. They had the sequence camera. They had all that. They had the TV camera. Uh, I had a camera in orbit, but I do not do selfies. Okay? <laughs> Dave and Jim, with their cameras, took, and I quote a number, I say, they took 7,000 pictures of each other. It's probably closer to 1,000, but let's, you know, let's say. Just for, just for purposes of uh, explanation. And I thought, you know, but my shot's gonna come when I do my EVA. And they're gonna take lots of pictures. Jim's is gonna be in the hash taking pictures and all that. And he's got the sequence camera going. And after the EVA, and we're all buttoned up and on our way back home, we realized that there's only one picture of me that really came out for my EVA. And that's me going out the hatch. <laughs> Not exactly my best side. Uh, uh, and that's the only picture that was taken. And I, 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 I convinced myself there was a conspiracy about all that. <laughs> but that was a, but it was very quick. The important thing about that EVA outside of bringing the film back in was the view I had. That was extraordinary. I went back out a third time, put my feet in some foot restraints and just looked around. And lo and behold, I could see the Earth and the Moon at the same time. Unbelievable place to be, yeah. Pretty, pretty impressive. Is it? I mean, is it? Uh, it's on spot. Is it lonely? Is it? I mean, I'd like. I kind of. What is the? What is the emotional? You mean during the EVA? Yeah. Or anytime. Anytime. Well, sure. I'll take. Well, the, I've been asked thing. that question a lot. There's a, there's a difference between being lonely and being alone. I was alone, but I was never lonely. Okay. In fact, the best part of the flight for me was when I was by myself in lunar orbit, and those guys had gone somewhere else. Uh, after you lived with two guys for four and a half days in a vehicle the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, you're only too happy to see them go somewhere uh, and, and do something else. So I had all that space to myself. Um, and so that, that, and that was fine. Uh, I think most of us in the program, well, even up through all, all the Apollo flights, basically most of the guys were pilots with a lot of experience. And most of the pilots with the experience were fighter pilots, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're very used to being in a small cockpit, a cramped space, flying a very high performance airplane. And space flight is no different. I, I, and I need to give you some comparisons. Jerry touched on Mercury, Gemini, and, and Apollo, how the stair step solutions were. But let's talk about size for a minute. Mercury was 45 cubic feet for one person. Okay, 45 cubic feet, keep that in mind. Gemini was 67, or maybe, well, somewhere, yeah. 67 cubic feet, I think, for two, right? To be clear, these are about the size of a lot of car trunks you're talking about. Yeah. Well, talking well about let me tell you. Yeah. Do you know how big a casket is? 
<laughs> no. 45 cubic feet. Okay, there you okay. go. <laughs> so Apollo had 220 cubic feet for the three of us, which was the Cadillac of the spacecraft. Problem is, it's the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And for four and a half days with two guys, it's not, you have to get used to it. We were explorers, we'd put up with anything. You know, one of the things about that though, that's where weightlessness helped you. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. that was much bigger yeah. volume than it would have been here on Earth. Because you use every little nook and cranny of it. And uh, anyway. Oh, you're right. Yeah. All that space is usable. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I know on Apollo 7, Don Isley used to curl up in the, in the tunnel uh, at, the, at the nose of the spacecraft. That's where he'd sleep. And Jim Irwin uh, did that sometimes, too. Uh, so all that space, whichever direction it goes, it's all usable uh, when you're in space. Larry, so speaking of size, how, how, what's the size comparison for, I guess, Orion and, and the like, extended module as well? Well, I was going to say this is actually really interesting to hear Al talk about this because um, Orion, to begin with, is about 15 feet or 5 meters in diameter. So we have about another third as much volume as the Apollo capsule did for three crew members. So it's comparatively quite a bit bigger, but it's actually quite interesting because we're having to retrain our NASA engineers and our astronauts to think we are explorers because we have gotten really used to living in a space station the size of a football field, right? So they've gotten used to the creature comforts of exercise equipment and special food and they can talk to anybody at home anytime they want to and we can take, we are not mass limited, we can take creature comforts up to space station with us. And we're having to re-vector everyone back to this fighter pilot explorer kind of mentality for taking Orion back to the moon and on to Mars um, because we have, we have kind of, you know, drifted away from that over the last 30 years with the space station program. So again, when you're, when you're limited predominantly by mass, there's just only so much you can take with you and you have to make all of those trades and you have to start thinking again kind of fighter pilot risk uh, mentality when you're exploring. No, that's, that's a fast, I mean, I personally, I always think of these first trips to, uh, to Mars or things like that, and I'm like, who could I possibly spend that much time with for, you know, a year or two years potentially, right, a round trip? Um, like, is there anybody on Earth, I couldn't even be there with my own mother for that long, <laughs> and I love her, but sorry, Especially mom. your mother. Yeah, maybe especially my mother. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, I wanted to talk to you about, so flight director, I mean, I. You know, I, I grew up, obviously, I, you know, I, I watched Apollo 13, and you know, my job was a, a lot more calm uh, than, than the, the experience, of course, in that movie. But you obviously had to make some real-time calls a number of times. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear kind of what your thought process, how you, how you approach those problems, um, and, and then leading the, uh, one of the anomaly teams for Apollo 13. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, actually, many of us in, in mission control had... Um, similar backgrounds to what Al was talking about. I had been in a fighter squadron. I was a backseater in a supersonic jet interceptor uh, before I got to NASA. And so, and Jane Kranz, the guy with the vest, um, was a fighter pilot. Uh, Pete Frank, another flight director, fighter pilot. Milt Wendler, another guy, fighter pilot. But we had a couple of guys that weren't, and they were really good. What, the biggest thing we had, and I don't know how you had to play it at JPL, uh, we had kind of a, a single czar in those days, and his name was Chris Kraft. And Chris had an uncanny ability, I think, to find people that he knew would fit that model that you're talking about, rapid decision. And actually, most of the guys, and there were only guys then in mission control, um, love that being out on the end of the diving board by themselves with nobody else, they had to make the decision. And I bet your JPL thing was the same way. It, it was kind of the way we were wired. But Kraft had an ability to pick those kind of people out. We didn't have many people that, I, mean, I don't think we had anybody that got fired from mission control. We had some guys that, that quit because it just wasn't their cup of tea. They weren't, it wasn't in their DNA that they liked to be out there on the end of the diving board by themselves. Now Kraft actually picked the flight directors. Today they have a very 
different kind of process to pick mission flight controllers and flight directors. But in, in our case, if craft, re I was a guidance, navigation, and control systems guy for Gemini and was getting ready to do the same thing for, for Apollo, and I was in the control center the night of the fire, that uh, it put us on hold for almost two years. And in that break, Chris uh, decided, Chris Kraft decided that he needed three more flight directors. And one day I got a call from him, he said, and he called everybody young man. Um, he said, young man, I want you to be a flight director. And I said, yes, sir. And uh, that's about the way it happened. It was that simple. And, uh, you know, I later, deputy director of two NASA centers, and then came back to Johnson Space Center in Houston as the director. And people asked me, what was the best job you ever had? By far, by far, it was a flight director in Apollo. It was the most satisfying, fun thing. And we were all young enough that uh, in fact, I was 34, 33 when I was made a flight director. And uh, I was one of some of the older guys because I'd been in the Air Force for a while. So it was an honor. I don't think any of us had the um, impression that 50 years later that we would be sitting here uh, talking about this subject. Uh, that 50 years goes pretty fast, let me warn you. Uh, <laughs> it goes pretty fast. Jerry, how many, how many guys that, did you work with who, who were Canadian? The guys who came down from Canada. I, thought, I always yeah. thought that was kind yeah, of an interesting had, point. When the space program got started, there was a company called Avro in Canada. Yeah. And um, they, um, I think they actually shut down in at least the major part of their stuff. And we got a number of those Canadian guys that came down um, first on the space task group before NASA was uh, really up and trying to get into space. And uh, they stuck with us. We had a flight director by named John Hodge that was one of those. He was, a, he was only a flight director for Gemini. But um, yeah, we had, and, and let me tell you something else. People talk, you know, should there be military space or, or whatever. We would not have done Apollo without the military. We used their tracking stations. The Corps of Engineers built the, built the facilities at the Cape. And then we had uh, officers that actually joined us and sat right beside us with a civilian suit on and, and wore the same badge we did. And there weren't a lot, but there was enough that they really filled in the spots. So we were using the whole country's assets to get Apollo done. And then we also had the Canadians that came in and were a big help. And uh, so it was a real team effort. And, uh, but it was a space race. There's no doubt about it. We were up against the Soviets. We didn't talk about it every day, but we knew it was there. And even with the two-year delay after the fire, uh, we made it in John Kennedy's uh, decade, barely. And now we got the Chinese and maybe we got another space race going. What do you think? I think we could. Uh, Chinese are good. They, everybody that's been Awful there. good. I think, I think um, Charlie Duke has actually got in. He said, I tell you what, it is impressive what they're doing in manned spaceflight. Uh, human spaceflight, I better <laughs> learn to say that. Um, so I, I think we're off on a, a great period of, in space history. I, I would like to, can I ask a oh, question? Please, yeah. yeah, I'd like to ask a question of, about the gateway. What are we gonna use the gateway for? Yeah, that's so that's a, that's a great yeah. question. So the question du jour is, right, do you go to the moon or do you go to Mars? And people have their differing opinions. Um, the answer really for us is both, right? Um, getting to Mars with a rover is hard enough. Getting to Mars with people and keeping them alive and bringing them home is even harder. Um, and so you have to take it in steps. You can't just throw someone out to Mars and expect to bring them home alive. So it, it's going to take steps. Um, from a lunar perspective, you know, the Apollo program was about 
point solutions. They launched and they landed somewhere and they came back. The idea with the gateway is to get to the lunar surface in a more sustainable way, to be able to get there and stay there, to leave humans in the presence of the moon for a longer period of time, not just two weeks. So, and in doing that, we build up our understanding of what it means to live and to work and survive in deep space and then be able to take the next step onto Mars. So the gateway, we call it a, a, a lunar orbiting platform. It will be in a fairly stable orbit around the moon that actually gets us to the poles. Um, because the poles is where a lot of the really interesting science is. So if we are in the orbit around the poles, um, the idea, it, and the other word you're, you'll hear is sustainable. I mean, these guys, you'll hear numbers like, and someone can correct me, I mean, we were putting 5% of the federal budget into the Apollo program. NASA today gets less than half a percent of the federal budget, and that's not all human spaceflight. That's going into all of the wonderful, you know, planetary science, it's going into aeronautics. So the, the money that's coming into the human spaceflight programs at NASA is a, is a fraction of what these guys had 50 years ago. So to do it sustainably, we have to do it in partnerships. No one's gonna do it alone, not, an, not a company, not a government. It's gonna take a lot of cooperation. So you'll hear the word with um, Gateway as being, uh, again, sustainable, and how do you do that? You find partnerships that come together to make it happen. We, um, you guys are all aware you know, of the commercial industry that has been born over the last eight years, right? We need the commercial industry to come in and help us. We have built strong international partnerships through the International Space Station. Uh, just last week, the international partnerships between NASA, European Space Agency, the Japanese, Russians, and Canadians all formally released their public support for the Gateway with all of the nations um, setting their sights on this being the best way to return to the moon and then go on to Mars. So the idea is to have a platform it's small, it's about the 10th of the space station. So it's not rebuilding space station in the lunar orbit, it's, it's just a platform that then the lunar modules can fly up to and then there's the concept is to have refuelers or tankers come up and then the, the lunar uh, modules will be able to go down to the surface and back and down to the surface and back and that's where a lot of the reusability and the sustainability comes in. So. Uh, so that's the concept of the gateway. We are brand new. I've been on the job literally since December. Um, so we're building up, but uh, there's, a, you know, we're hoping to get our first module up. Uh, it's called the power and propulsion element in 2022. Uh, we'll get up some habitation space in the 24 kind of time frame. Uh, and the idea, hopefully we see the first decent lander in 2024. That's amazing. We are cutting it close on time, so I don't want to <coughs> cut anybody off, but can I, let me just ask you guys down the line, like where can people find out more about what you're working on or where can they find you here at Thousand Lot, Laura, if you wanna start? Uh, yeah, for the work going on inside NASA, nasa.gov is one of the best places to go. Uh, you'll see, you know, a lot of the latest, um, you know, publicly released information, particularly on, on Gateway Orion SLS Space Station. I would say nasa.gov, we also, I don't, I'm not smart in this area, but we have smart people that do Twitter and all of that kind of good stuff. We've so you can follow us on Twitter. We've got some in the front row right here. <laughs> uh, find them, they're in this corner right here if you want to learn a lot more about where to follow all these social mediums. Yeah, Jared, you got, you got, where can people find you? Uh, well, they probably find Al and me in the same place. <laughs> washed up flight controllers and astronauts.com, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, over the years, there's a pretty good background on me that somebody's keeping up to date on Wikipedia, and it's pretty accurate. Um, uh, in fact, is it, is it you? Are you updating the Wikipedia? Well, I, <laughs> if I knew how, I, I'd go straighten up some things. But it, everything in there is is has been done well, and uh, so I got an admirer somewhere uh, that uh, is taking care of me. You got books and everything else. This guy's... Yeah, Al, what about you? You looked at the first one. Oh, no, I just wanted to, if, you, if you want to find you or, or learn more about you or anything like that, is there well, a I, bio? I probably think differently than a lot of people do. I, 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 I look at space flight as something beyond making a flight. 
um, one, one of the most interesting things on my flight uh, was being in a position behind the moon on, on, on one side. There was a, there was a pie-shaped wedge of the orbit where I was shadowed from both the Earth and the sun. And suddenly the universe became something that I just almost couldn't comprehend. And we, we kind of looked at it afterwards and realized that there were probably uh, a million times as many stars that you could see from there that you can see through the atmosphere. And that makes you wonder about the universe and our, and our place in it. So I, I, I guess I've spent some time thinking about all of that. And, and I've come to the conclusion that we have a genetic drive uh, that is tagged to our imperative uh, to ensure that our species survives. Every single living thing on Earth has that imperative of survival. And I don't think people are any different. And I think, to me, I, I, I see the space program as the tiny baby steps that are eventually going to get us someplace we can live when we can't live here anymore. So to me, that's what's important about space right now. It's great to go back to the moon. I think we need to go and find out what it's, it's going to be like to live there and how we're going to survive there. And then we're going to go to Mars and do the same thing. But we're going to go beyond that. Eventually, it may take us 10,000 years to get someplace else. But that's the direction we're headed, and that's why we're doing it. Thank you. Uh, do you guys want to come up if there's questions and answers? You guys can, there's some mics in the aisles here, and there's also, uh, we got a bunch uh, here from the slido.com folks. Um, I guess let's take the uh, one, which technical, technological advancements stemming from programs like Apollo have benefited society the most in the decades since? I know there's a lot of spin-off technologies in almost everything that NASA does, but do you guys have any examples that you're particularly fond of? Well, yeah, the cell phones that were, <laughs> I, th I think, you know, and maybe space gets a little too much credit for things like that. What we had to do and what you had to do to get to, to Mars with the rover, uh, Curiosity, is you had to m make everything small, lightweight. Uh, so it drove, that period drove a lot of materials, new kinds of materials. It drove the electronics industry to come up with little chips that heretofore uh, carried all kinds of volume and mass and weight and heat. Um, so I think the, the fallout, and then of course the industry picked that up and made it happen. NASA didn't do that. But uh, I think it drove, it accelerated at least the technological changes that uh, required uh, miniature uh, devices of one kind or another. And I think uh, we learned a lot about space medicine from these guys that, that I think uh, will put us ahead in those steps that you're talking about that I agree with you totally. One day we're going to need another, this species is going to have to go somewhere else. We're going to use this planet up. It may be 20,000 years. I don't know. But, but we better, we're, even, even Mars is just a baby step. It's, it's a, it's a, big relative step, but, it, but it's just a baby step in the bigger picture. So the technological advancements are, are really important to get us where we are, and there will be some more breakthroughs. These guys are going to drive, um, both of them sitting at each end here, are going to drive further uh, breakthroughs. Do you, do you have any one that you're particularly fond of from the programs you've worked on? I th like I said, it was interesting, you know, a decade ago, you saw it in electronics. You really saw it in electronics, just in the speed of the processing and the, the size, as um, Jerry mentioned. But I tell you what, today it's all about materials, new materials, composite materials, lightweight, high-strength materials. And we're going to see materials in the next decade, I think, that people aren't even dreaming about today. You know, we hear a lot of... A lot of talk about exploring. Exploring is such a grand thing. We're going to explore the moon. We're going to explore Mars. Um, and, and, and so often we hear the justification for going somewhere else is the exploration of a foreign body. Of, uh, and when we go to Mars, you're going to hear a lot about exploring Mars and all that. But to me, the most important thing about the space program overall is the development of technology that will, will allow us to do those things. And I, I, I totally agree with Jerry. Uh, uh, silicon chips were developed back in the late 50s through a secret government program. They were then into the Air Force and then into NASA, 
and NASA spread them out through all the commercial manufacturers, and all of a sudden, you've got solid-state devices that benefit everybody in every aspect, in every part of their life. That technology development made this country so great for 30 years. Now we're looking at going to Mars, and I, in my mind, we got to develop a, a completely new level of technology to make sure we can do that the way we're supposed to. And I think that uh, once we get into that and that technology gets developed, we're going to see the same thing happen that happened in Apollo. I think I, I absolutely believe that the most important thing about the space program is the technology that it forces us to develop. Right. Let me take one from uh, over here. This, this. Um, thanks. Uh, I enjoyed uh, listening about the chronology of the, the program, and I thought I uh, asked the question, was there a time when you realized that you're going to have to redesign a bunch of systems for the Van Allen hazards that you were experiencing. Uh, the Van Allen belt um, radiation, yeah. is that what the question? Yeah, uh, yeah that's yeah. right. Um, yeah, you know, that was really pinned down with Jupiter, that our answer to Sputnik uh, was an unmanned thing. It looked kind of like a, a small rocket that you'd see launched in a in a uh, parking lot, uh, that's what it looked like. But Van Allen himself was part of that experiment team, and that's that's where they discovered the, there's actually two belts, a low belt and a higher belt. Um, and then there's something called the South Atlantic Anomaly, where because of the offset between, I won't get too deep here, mag north, magnetic north, and, and the way the Earth is actually rotating on its axis, there's a place where the radiation uh, comes through stronger at to lower altitudes, and it's the same Van Allen radiation. These are belts where trapped particles, ionized uh, particles are trapped, and you have to fly through them. Now, most of the space station is just below the lowest belt, but even it has to fly through that South Atlantic anomaly and uh, try to avoid EVAs when you're going through there because you, you lose the protection of the, of the metal um, of the space station itself. But radiation is, we've learned how to handle it in low Earth orbit, let me just say that. We know how to do it. Uh, we used to, we were very cognizant of it back in, in Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, um, but it was, uh, it was not as big an issue Mars, I think, is probably the biggest issue is radiation and how to protect the crew. Uh, by the way, I learned something I didn't realize. I thought, you know, the radiation would be strong enough that it would be like Hiroshima or Nagasaki. That's not the case. What they worry about is the exposure of a two-year, up to two-year round trip. It's the medical uh, condition that after that, that very uh, prone to cancer uh, with that much radiation exposure. You could probably do the mission, but it's, we got to figure out a better way to protect them. And, and that's probably the long pole in the tent. Um, let me, if I could take a second. Yeah. One of the things I hear they're looking at now is a double wall spacecraft. And it turns out water is a very good protector of radiation, a shield. And we have fuel cells on board. You put oxygen and hydrogen together, it produces power, electrical power. But a byproduct is water. So you could launch with these walls empty and then use some portion, not all, but some portion of, of the water from the fuel cells to fill that void. And so you don't have to lift all that. You couldn't lift it off the pad, you couldn't lift it filled up already. So you gotta fill it while you're on the way. I don't know whether that'll work or not. I don't know if whether they can produce enough water. But it's a, it's a big problem. And uh, the understanding, the question is a good one, because understanding that Van Allen belts and where they were and how they were oriented really got us into that, uh, what does it do to a human? I wanna say proudly that Explorer 1 satellite built at JPL where I work today. Um, all right, well, we have to conclude here, I guess, for the last, last final minute here. Um, so let me just thank our panelists. Thank you guys so much for coming out here today. I can give a big round of applause. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank...
At one point, I had a slide controller, but if I could show the next slide, I would appreciate it. I want to thank the, um, you guys could just skip ahead one slide, because I somehow have lost the control. Um, yep, I would like to thank the Aldrin Founda Family Foundation for putting this event on today. Uh, and if you go one more slide, uh, the People's Moon Project. Um, I'd love to hear where uh, people were, of course, during uh, the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. And for, for younger folks who weren't, like myself, who weren't there, uh, what is your next giant leap? Um, so you can use the two hashtags there at the bottom, a hashtag Apollo 50 or hashtag my giant leap, and talk about those and find out more at the People's Moon. Thank you guys so much for coming today. Um, again, if you guys want to find out more on social media, there's a bunch of people right here in the front of the room. I'll plug them as well. Um, and thank you all.